Well, please take your Bibles and hope you have one with you. If you don't, it's all right, we'll have it on the screen. But take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians 6. I'm sure by now, if you've been a part of this series, that you have a well-worn indentation there in Ephesians 6 as we're walking through uh, the battle that we are in as described in this great passage. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, said this, like the Spartans, every Christian is born a warrior. It is his destiny to be assaulted, his duty to attack. I know sometimes in our modern day, we bristle a little bit at these images of warfare, being a soldier. There are, of course, other analogies in the New Testament to being a follower of Jesus, whether it's being an athlete or a farmer, a a mother, a brother, a son, lots of other different descriptions of how we are to follow Jesus. But you can't get away from the fact that throughout the Bible, battle imagery, soldier imagery is used again and again and again. And in this particular passage, Ephesians 6, we are reminded of this great battle that we are in, not with flesh and blood. Now, there may be times where you're battling a person, but the curtain is drawn back, and we see in this text that there's something behind the curtain, and that is, of course, uh, the devil and his demons and other... um, others who are opposed to the things of God. Our mission as a church is that we exist to help people find truth, belonging, and purpose in Jesus. And all three of those things, truth in Jesus, belonging in the family of God in Jesus, purpose, particularly towards the Great Commission in Jesus, all those things are accompanied by a battle. If you think they come easy, then you have missed the point. So we wanna look once again at Ephesians chapter six. I'll read for us verses 13 through 17 as we look at these different pieces of armor. And today we will camp out on the fourth piece of armor, but let's read it one more time. If you would, let's stand together. Ephesians chapter six, verses 13 through 17. This is what God says. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist on the evil day and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having belted your waist with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having strapped on your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Today we're going to look at the the shield of faith. What does that mean? How do we apply that in our lives? Before we jump into it, let's pray and ask God's help. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you teach, that you encourage, that you equip. Lord, in this text today, would it be more than just an intellectual exercise of learning something new, but God, would we truly see the value of faith? Would we truly see the enemy that we are up against? And God, may we walk out of here confident because of who you are and what you've done through Jesus. It's in your name that we pray, amen, amen. Have a seat. The Apostle Paul, the human author of Ephesians, looked at a Roman soldier and he saw all these different pieces of armor, whether it was his belt or his breastplate, his helmet, shoes, sword, other things. He said, you know, that's a, that's a beautiful picture, a, a perfect picture really for the analogy of how we as Christians should be clothed in our war. Now, not everyone here is a follower of Jesus, though I assume most of you are. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you are to put on this armor. You're not born with this armor. You're not even born again with this armor. This is a daily pursuit to be clothed in the right things and the right mindset and the right attitudes so that when you go into the battle, you are prepared. A Roman soldier had to be prepared. And in addition to his belt and his breastplate and his helmet and his his uh, shoes, he was to have a shield. The Romans had different kinds of shields. Like, have you ever seen, uh, you know, Captain America has that little shield he can do whatever he wants with? Well, it was nothing like that, all right. So he had a different kind of shield in the Roman uh, army, and it looked something like this, about two feet by four feet. It was made of two pieces of wood. They would, um, they would fashion the wood together, and then they would actually cover it with canvas 
and leather, so cowhide. And then they would take iron on the top and on the bottom. And in the middle there, that, that ball thing is an iron boss. And so that would, of course, keep swords and arrows from, from penetrating the shield, and they would bounce off of them. And this is what they would take into battle with them for protection. It was largely a defensive shield against fiery arrows. You've probably seen movies, ancient warfare, and you see the army on top of this mountainside, and they all fling these flaming arrows into the air, and it's just this harrowing sight. And of course, they would stick up their shields, and it would defend the arrow. Well, what is, what is the Apostle Paul telling us here as believers in Jesus? He's saying that there are fiery darts being thrown your way, and you are to extinguish them, extinguish them with the shield of faith. What does that mean? Fiery darts here could be interpreted to cover from different ways. Some people think fiery darts is just a way of saying, look, these are all the sinful temptations that we could give into on any given day. And all of us are tempted to give into the, the love of our flesh. All of us are tempted every single day to not be driven by the spirit, be driven by our flesh. And that is true, that, that we're all tempted. But I think Paul here is not just talking about general temptation, but rather he is talking about specific, temporary thoughts that come into your mind that are ultimately from the devil that are meant to, to, to push you off course, to lead you astray. There might be times where you're worshiping, maybe this morning you, you were worshiping Jesus and out of nowhere this vile image came into your mind. Or maybe you've been reading the Bible or something that helps you connect with God. And just out of nowhere, these images of, of it could be something perverted, something sexual, it could be something, you just, you name, things that you weren't even thinking about just come into your mind. In some ways, those could be the fiery darts of the enemy. These fiery darts could include images of sexual perversion, suicidal thoughts, um, compulsive images of doing horrible things, impulses to rebel against those you love, places of authority, your family, the church, other rightful institutions of authority. It could be false feelings of guilt, of shame. The, these arrows that come at us, and we are told to extinguish them. The Roman soldier would take his shield, of course, and the outer part of it was made of leather. They would dip it in water so that if an arrow were to stick in the shield, it would be extinguished. The, the arrow would hit it, but it would quickly be extinguished. And I think Paul is saying that's true for us, that, that these arrows are gonna come your way and you can't stop the arrows from coming. They're going to come. But you do have resources to be able to extinguish the fire that those arrows wanna put in your life. And he calls it the shield of faith, faith. We talk about faith a lot, don't we, at church? What is, what is faith? It's trust. The Bible talks about saving faith and sanctifying faith. Saving faith is, of course, that faith when you hear the gospel, you hear what Christ has done, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins because he loves you, he doesn't want you to go to hell, he doesn't want you to experience the wrath of God, he doesn't want you to, to, to basically get what you deserve, and so he dies on the cross in your place so that you might give the, be given the righteousness of God, and then he defeats death and the grave and Satan by rising from the grave. Easter, an amazing promise, so that you can not only have abundant life here, but eternal life forever, and when you transfer all that authority and power from your life into the hands of Jesus, it's saving faith. But even if you've been following Jesus for years and years, you still have sanctifying faith, that faith that, that helps you to keep believing, keep trusting, keep growing, keep depending more and more upon the things of Jesus. And that's why even if you've been a follower of Jesus for, for decades, you need to develop rising up that shield of faith that you could extinguish the arrows of the evil one. Today I wanna to talk about um, the source of this battle. And that of course is the role that Satan plays. To make maybe an overgeneralized statement, my hunch is that most of us, not all, but most of us I think 
overestimate the power of Satan and underestimate the power of the gospel. Because when we hear about Satan, we get paralyzed, we get fearful, we, we, we get spooked out. Instead of what we should do in the gospel is be confident that because of Jesus, we're not fighting for victory, we're fighting from victory, amen? And then we need to learn about Satan. Sometimes people think, well, all that Satan stuff is just weird. I mean, it's just, you, you think about Satan, you know, people who are influenced by Satan, those are people who are you know, barking like dogs or howling at the moon or their head spinning backwards, they're throwing up green soup or they're you know, doing something. That's what Satan, satanic behavior looks like. And maybe sometimes it does, but often it's pretty deceptive. The, the Bible says that Satan always comes disguised as an angel of light. He loves to deceive. And most people find him to be, well, rather appealing. So we have to be on our toes. We have to be watching out. I wanna give you a great uh, recommended resource today, Understanding Spiritual Warfare by a gentleman by the name of Sam Storms, who I do not know, but I found this book to be tremendously helpful. If you're looking for a great resource to learn more about spiritual warfare, I love that this book is thoroughly biblical. It answers a lot of questions that you may have about spiritual warfare. And it's not scared to say, we don't know, or to use speculation. Uh, it doesn't go down that road to try to scare you to death into Satan, but rather says, look, this is what we can know through the Bible. This is a great resource. And he gave this illustration here I thought was really good from an old movie, World War II movie called Patton. I don't know if you've ever seen this movie, George Patton. And there's a scene where the Allied forces figure out that the Nazis are gonna attack them, led by a guy named uh, Rommel. You may remember that from, from your World War II history. And there's a scene where they wake up General Patton telling him of this impending attack. And the camera shows his bedside table and there's a book uh, called, I think, The Tank in Warfare by, by Erwin Rommel. And then it fast forwards to the battle and the allies are winning the war and it shows George Patton smiling through his binoculars and he just grits his teeth and says, he says, Rommel, you magnificent. And then he uses a word I'm not gonna use. But he says, you magnificent, fill in the blank. And then he says, he says, I've read your book. And of course, the point is, he, he read the book, he knew what he was gonna do and therefore it led to the victory. In a way, that's what we're called to do. That Satan is gonna attack you if you're a student at school. He's gonna attack you at work. He's gonna attack you in your home sometimes, even within the church. And we have to know his tactics, know how he works, and then of course, know even more the power of Jesus. So let me give you a quick overview of Satan. There's so much more that we could say than we'll say today, but I wanna talk about who he is and, and how he works. Who he is and how he works. Who, who is Satan? Well, the Bible tells us in passages like Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 that he was apparently an angel created before human beings who rebelled against God along with other angels and was banished from the presence of God. He goes by many names, Satan, which means the adversary. He's also called the devil, Diabolos, which means slanderer, you know, someone who slanders is someone who lies about you or lies about things to you. He's excellent at that. Earlier in Ephesians chapter two, it said that he's the prince of the power of the air. Not the king, but the prince of the power of the air. And in other words, in some ways, this, this world in which we live in is, is governed or at least is influenced greatly in some way by the measure of the power of Satan. And he fights. He fights against God, his angels fight against God's angels, he fights against believers, he fights against unbelievers. But what does the Bible tell us about Satan, the role he plays, his tactics, and what are we to do about it? Let me give you a quick overview. We'll just start here, number one. He actively opposes the gospel. So if you wanna share Jesus with your friend, or you wanna share the gospel with somebody at a coffee shop, um, note that there are, there's a whole spiritual battle happening that you can't see. And Satan hates it, hates it when we talk about Jesus. When we talk about the good news of Jesus, he hates it. It says this in 2 Corinthians 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The reason your friend hasn't come to Christ 
It's probably not because you haven't yet given this incredible argument for Jesus. It's probably because their minds are blinded by the God of this world. It's like when Jesus told that story, remember about the, the, the farmer who went out and he sowed seed, and there were different you know, soils. And remember he said this, he threw some seed and fell on a, on a path and before you know it, birds came and they picked up the seed and it flew away and it never had a chance to get into the soil. He says that's what Satan does. You hear the gospel and then he quickly just kind of brushes it off so you don't, you don't internalize it and he's blinding your, your eyes. Number two, Satan is often, but not always, the source of sickness. We wanna be careful here because many of you are struggling with sickness right now. You may have a diagnosis that you're struggling with or some health problem that you're going through right now and I don't at all wanna intimate that every time you're sick it's because of Satan. The Bible doesn't talk about sickness like that. Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. Um, she had a fever and he healed her from it didn't say that she was impacted by Satan, just said she had a fever and he healed her um, by his power. But there are times when Satan apparently can cause sickness. In Luke 13, there was a woman, it says, and this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years. Should she not have been released from this restraint on the Sabbath day? The religious leaders were arguing with Jesus, why would you heal this woman on the Sabbath day? Talk about being deceived by the devil. And Jesus said, this woman has been struggling with what Satan has bound in her for 18 years, and he healed her. Again, not to suggest that if you're sick, it's because of Satan, but perhaps you have dismissed a spiritual element to your sickness that would be important for you to know. Number three, he, meaning Satan, he can inflict death and the fear of it. Remember the Old Testament story of Job, or as I used to say as a kid, Job? I didn't know until I was like 20-something it was Job. Anyways, remember Job? And God allowed Satan to test him, to put him through trials, and many of his family members died, at, at least the indirect hand of Satan. Now, Let's make sure we know that's somewhat exceptional. Throughout the rest of the Bible, we don't see that happening a lot, but in that instance, it happened. But there are times when Satan can either inflict death or give you the fear of death. Revelation chapter two. This is what Jesus says to this church. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. You're about to go into prison for 10 days because you're gonna stand up for Jesus. That's what he's telling this church. And you're gonna go through tribulation and it's gonna be hard. Now note at the end of the verse, it doesn't say, and then I'll get you out of heaven and I mean, I'll get you out of jail and you realize how awesome it is. No, 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 you're gonna probably die in prison. But be faithful unto death. Satan can oftentimes not only bring death, but certainly the fear of death. If we are ever living with the paralyzing fear of death, it is not from God. Number five, or number four, excuse me, he plants sinful plans and purposes in the minds of men. Sinful plans and purposes in the minds of men. Do you remember in Acts chapter, I think it's five, where this early church has started and apparently they had agreed that we're gonna sell all our stuff and give it to the work of the kingdom and they were all doing that. Well, there was this couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. Remember them? And apparently they sold some land and I guess had promised that they were gonna give these proceeds to the work of, of God that was happening there in Jerusalem and they, and they held back some of the proceeds and they had lied about what they were doing. And, and this is what the text says here in Acts chapter five. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan, Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the proceeds of the land? Apparently they had given in to an impulse that Satan had put about what they should do with that money. And do you remember what happened to he and his wife after they lied about this? Anybody remember? They died. Talk about an effective capital campaign. What if we just said, hey, we're gonna raise some money 
We're gonna call it, this is the name of our new capital campaign, Give or Die. That's what we're gonna call it. <laughs> now, again, an exceptional event in scripture, but Satan had put this into his, into his mind and he paid a price. Number five, this goes with it, Satan can indwell and demonize people. The word demon possession is not in the Bible. The King James Version translates it as demon possession, though that's probably not the best translation. I think the better one is to say uh, that Satan can demonize people, and there might be a spectrum here. He can, demon, he can influence, he can demonize people. We certainly see people in the scriptures who were influenced at great lengths by demons. Sometimes influenced in ways they were unaware of, sometimes in ways that it changed their personalities, changed their behaviors, they, they were harmful to themselves and to others. Jesus once encountered such a person who was inflicted with demons in Luke chapter eight, Here's what it says, Jesus was on a boat, and then it says, and he stepped out onto the land, and a man from the city met him who was possessed with demons, and he had not put on clothing for a long time and was not living in a house but among the tombs. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. The, the word legion, it means 1,000. Is he saying 1,000 demons had entered this man? but he was greatly influenced. There are ways in which we can be influenced by demons in, in ways that we are not always um, willing to admit. And we often give the devil an opportunity to influence us in ways that we are unwilling to admit. Like here's one example. Go back to Ephesians chapter four. Look at verse 26 and 27. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Paul here is talking about this walk that we should have, you know, with integrity. And he says in verse 26, be angry and yet do not sin. That's hard to do, by the way. But be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. In other words, put it out, extinguish that arrow quickly. Why? And do not give the devil an opportunity. Did you know one of the, one of the main ways that the devil can influence you is through unresolved anger? If you're harboring bitterness, resentment, hurt, and not processing through that, then the devil can often grab that anger, that hurt, that bitterness. And if you're not careful, you will give him an opportunity to do things in your life. So he can use that. And number six, he sets up traps to trip up Christians. He sets up traps, and I think he does that for all of us. He can set a trap in different ways. In 2 Timothy chapter two, he's talking here to pastors, so I think this would apply to every Christian leader. But I want you to hear not only what the leader's called to do, but why they're called to do it. 2 Timothy chapter two, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, skillful in teaching, patient when wrong, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. So let's pause there. We are trying to correct people who are doing and believing the wrong things. Why are we trying to do that? Here we go, back to the verse. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses, and listen to this phrase, and escape from the snare of the devil having been held captive by him to do his will. There are people going this way when they should be going this way, and, and those of us in leadership are called to gently bring them back to the truth. Why? Because they're caught in the snare of the devil. And here's what's crazy. All of us have temptations, all of us have weak points, and all of you are tempted in ways that the person beside you is not. And they're tempted in a way the person beside them is not. And all, all of us have temptations, weaknesses, vulnerabilities. And so this is a text that tells us that we are at war, but we are to stand strong. We are to stand firm. How? Well, with all these pieces of armor, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, feet prepared with the gospel. And then today, today, he says, take up the shield of faith. Take up the shield of faith. That's what we're called to do. 
Now, you wonder, how do I do that? I'm going to school tomorrow. I'm, I'm going to work tomorrow. I'm dealing with some family members tomorrow. and We, we have a lot of conflict. I'm traveling tomorrow. I'm, I'm, what, how, how do I do that? Here's a couple ways we think about taking up the shield of faith. Number one, put it out front. Put it out front. The Roman soldier had a shield, and he was to put the shield out in front of all the other pieces of his armor. The, the shield was the first thing that took the attack. Put it out front. In other words, lead your life with faith. Make it the most important thing about you, your choice to believe God, to exercise faith in him. Abram, it was said in Romans 4, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. You're not kind of saved if you're a believer. You are saved because of the finished work of Jesus. And he has forgiven all your sins no matter what you have done. And you can live a life of faith because of what Jesus has done. So, so lead with faith. May, be a person who's known as a person of faith, exercising confident faith in the Lord. And, and the temptation of a message like this is sometimes to walk away and to be, to be unfortunately scared of the devil. If you walk out of here and, and you walk out with this paralyzing fear, the devil's behind everything and he's gonna get me and if I'm not careful, then, then he's gonna attack me, I'm gonna have an opportunity. Let me remind you, that the devil has already been defeated. I mean, he's been given some power now, yes, but one day Christ is coming back. One day Christ is gonna establish his kingdom forever and ever, and those of us who are believers will be with him physically forever and ever, living in the new kingdom, living in the heavens, new heavens, new earth, and the devil will be thrown to the lake of fire and banished forever, and that's good news, amen? And I, I love what the Bible says in Colossians 2 about what Jesus has done. It says in Colossians 2, when he, this is Jesus, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Satan loves to remind you of how awful you are and how much of a sinner you are and how you're not good enough. He loves to do that. But when Jesus died on the cross, he defeated Satan. And not only did he defeat him, but he made a public display of him. He picked that dragon up by the tail and he wagged it around him. <laughs> we don't fight for victory, folks. We fight from victory. You don't have to be scared of the devil because you have Jesus. But you have to be vigilant. So that goes to number two. What do we do with this shield? Well. You gotta pick it up. You gotta pick it up. I mean, the Roman soldier had to pick up his shield. I'm sure there were times where the Roman soldier was fighting in a battle and, and swords came or, or spears came, arrows came and the shield was knocked out. And before, before he would be penetrated with a, with a fatal blow, he would have to pick that shield back up again and fight again and again and again. And that is a picture of what we're called to do. Every single day, every hour, every minute of the day, we fight and we pick up that shield of faith again and again and again and again. And if you drop it, that's okay. Pick it back up again and live a life of faith. Proverbs 30 tells us that God is our shield. And I would say if your shield is nice and polished and beautiful and sparkles, it means you're not using it. The best shields are the ones that are dented and scarred, struck, because you're using them. Pick up the shield of faith. You're no good, the devil says. If people knew what you had done yesterday, they wouldn't even want to sit beside you. You call yourself a believer? But then I pick it up and I'm reminded, no, 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 there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Or you're, you're walking with Jesus and you're growing and you're seeing him do great things in your life and you're feeling confident in the Lord and, and, and you have a good mindset and all those things that are healthy and good and, and, then, you, and then you trip up 
And he laid a trap and you went right into it, back in that old pattern. You can't believe you said that. Why did I do that? Why did I, why did I, why did I go there? Why did I do that with that person? Why did I, why did I, why, how, how in the world could I? And Satan goes, because you're not, you're not who you think you are. But if we pick up that shield and we say, no, no, he who began a good work in me will complete it on the day of Christ Jesus. You gotta pick it up daily. One of the reasons that you are living such a defeated life is because you are not living with the shield of faith. And we pick it up, we put it out front, we pick it up. But here's the third thing. We take this shield, and number three, we protect each other. We protect each other. We we tend to think about a shield as something, you know, between me and Jesus, me and the devil, me and my shield. But if you were a Roman soldier, the shield wasn't just about you, it was about all of us. Look at this picture of uh, a formation that they would have been trained to use in the attack. And as you see these soldiers coming together in this picture, um, what does it look like to you? Looks like a turtle, doesn't it? Looks like a turtle. And the idea was when the arrows were coming and the, and the battle's coming, that there, this, this is a safe place. And when I see that picture, you know what I think of? That's the church. Now, we're not a holy huddle in the sense of we're trying to escape the world. No, we're still in the world doing ministry in the world. But we are to be a place that protects one another a place that lifts up our shield so the other person is safe, a place that lifts up our shields so that we could, well, we could be protected from the arrows of the evil one. Are you a part of the body of Christ, protected in the things of Jesus? I don't know what you're facing this week. I don't know what kind of battle you're in or if you're even willing to admit that you're in a battle. Maybe that's the biggest battle you have. But my hunch is all of us this week need to rise and raise up our shield of faith. I wrote a prayer this week, maybe to just put some words around what it means to take up a shield of faith. And I prayed it to the triune God, of course, praying to God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And this was my prayer. Triune God, I lift high my shield of faith in your name and your power. You are my strength, my protector. You are my shield, especially when my own shield of faith is weakened. No temptation that comes my way can penetrate your protecting hand. There are fiery darts headed my way even now as I pray. Lord, you already know what they are and have already provided the way of escape. I will not be afraid for you are with me. May Satan and his hosts shudder as your power is demonstrated through my faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Maybe that's a prayer that you need to use this week as you pick up your shield. In fact, I would just ask right now, would we all just stand together and let's offer this prayer to the Lord, just asking Him to move in our hearts and our lives. Would you say this with me and let's pray this to the Lord. Triune God, I lift high my shield of faith in your name, in your power. You are my strength, my protector. You are my shield, especially when my own shield of faith is weakened. No temptation that comes my way can penetrate your protecting hand. There are fiery darts headed my way, even now as I pray. Lord, you already know what they are and have already provided the way of escape. I will not be afraid, for you are with me. May Satan and his host shudder as your power is demonstrated through my faith. In Jesus' name I pray, and all God's people said, amen, and amen, and amen. Yes.